Let us pray. Father, Lord, we just come to you now. We thank you. You're just such an awesome God, and you love us so much. And despite our shortcomings and our failures and our mistakes, you take what the enemy means for bad, and you turn it around for our good. And you say that a willing heart is acceptable unto you. And you say that our righteousness is like filthy rags, but you, O oh Lord, are the righteous one. Yes, Thank you, Yeshua, for the sacrifice you made. Thank you, Abba, for sending Yeshua. And thank you, Yeshua, for sending the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Holy One to teach us all things, to comfort us, to guide us and direct us and lead us into all truth and help us to rightly divide your word. We give you all the praise and the glory and we pray now that your Holy Spirit will cause us all to have ears to hear what your Spirit is saying to this church, to each one of us, to each temple, each dwelling place in the Most High God. And we give you all the praise and the glory in the name of Yeshua. Now let me decrease as you increase. Guide my words. And we thank you in the name of Yeshua. Amen. I just want to look at Luke chapter 3 today. Uh, Pastor Johnny was uh, preaching last week, and I don't remember if this was part of. Uh, your, your text or not, but after you got done preaching, part of this text just kept jumping at me all week long. All week long, it just kept coming to me, and, and the Lord started revealing by His Holy Spirit different things uh, that we should learn from this good and bad. Amen? Amen. I'm going to be reading from the Tree of Life version. It's uh, my preferred version, the only... Uh, fault I have with it is that they do not use the true translation of uh, Yahweh's name each time it's used. So they just say Adonai. It's kind of like the King James says Lord. You know? And uh, I like to go back and look it up. So maybe that would be something to do. If, if during this passage it says Adonai or Lord, maybe uh, this week you could look it up. You know, That's good homework to study in the Bible and see what name of God if any is used in context. Well, actually, I was telling you, man, there's only one name for our Heavenly Father, and that is Yahweh, translated Jehovah. But there are many titles. That's my opinion. I'm sticking to it. But there are many titles. Praise God, praise God. Hallelujah. Let's go to Luke chapter 3, the Tree of Life version. Another good version is the English Standard Version. It's probably the most accurate. That's what I take Pastor Larry's uh, word on it. He's quite the scholar. And the English Standard Version is a very good version, as is um, the King James. Um, it's familiar and pretty much sticks to the context. Amen? It's important to know these things because as Bible translations go, they are, they being forces beyond us, you know, forces of, of darkness, they're taking the very word of God that we depend on to guide us and they are altering it. And I'll tell you one of the, the, the small tweaks, just for an example, they take the virgin birth out completely by replacing the word a young virgin with a young girl. And after a couple of generations of reading a young girl instead of a young virgin, you start having the virgin birth becoming folklore to, to the new generation because they, are, they mildly tweak the word of God in the translations. It's always good to go back now in this day and age with the internet and uh, Bible applications, logos, you also have e-sword, e-sword on your phones. It's like $1.99 on the computer, it's free. You can look up every single word in the scripture and take it back to the Hebrew or the Greek. Right? 
And if you can study the context of every word, it's just take one or two scriptures and go back and write it out, find the definition for each word, and then read it over and over and ask the Holy Spirit to really reveal to you the context of what the scripture is saying. Because that way you go back to the original and God who has the ability through the Holy Spirit to reveal to you what the word is really saying. That's why we say to rightly divide the word of truth. Amen? Yes. Amen. Rightly divide the word of truth. You're going to find so many things uh, as you study for yourself, not just what Pastor Timothy or any other pastor teaches you, but when you study for yourself, the best teacher, the Holy Spirit, will help you and teach you. Amen? And then if you have questions, you can go to your brothers and sisters, maybe those that God has placed over you as your pastors and your teachers, and you can discuss the things that the Holy Spirit is teaching you and what has revealed to you through the Word, and you'll find that that will create an energy and an excitement about the Word of God that you may not have ever had before, and not only for yourself, but for the one you are discussing this with, amen? Because iron sharpens iron, and when you do that, one plus one usually equals like 10, you know, because the Holy Spirit brings to life so much when you're discussing the Word of God in a spirit of unity, prayer, and being led by the Holy Spirit. My Lord Jesus. I won't be before you very long today. Luke chapter 3, John the Immerser at the Jordan. That's the heavy. It was now the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip was a tetrarch of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias was tetrarch of Abilene. I want you to have Pastor Larry read this for me. <laughs> During the high priesthood of Ananias and Caiaphas, the word of God came upon John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. Oh, by the way, there's a footnote. How do we know when Yeshua was really born? He was really born at the Feast of Tabernacles. How do we know? By following the temple duty of Zechariah and comparing it to the gestation of Mary and Elizabeth when Mary went to be with her. By doing that, you'll find that, that Yeshua was really born on Feast of Tabernacles, which is, tabernacle means what? God dwelling place. Amen. He's God with us, Emmanuel, amen. amen. Okay, just, just a little bit now. It all works together. Amen. The word of God came upon John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness, and he came into all the surrounding region of the Jordan, proclaiming an immersion of repentance for the removal of sins. As it is written in the scroll of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of Adonai and make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled up and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked shall be made straight and the rough ways made smooth. And all humanity shall see the salvation of God. Therefore John was saying to the crowds that came out to be immersed by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Therefore, produce fruits worthy of repentance. And don't even begin to say among yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that from these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham.
But I just had to dwell on the actual words used, the ruach, the, the spirit, or the wind. What does wind do? Remember when Nicodemus came to speak to, to Yeshua at, at nighttime? And uh, Jesus told him he must be born again. And then he used the example of the wind that bloweth, but you don't know. The wind, the spirit, the force that moves things even though you can't see it. Isn't, isn't, don't we serve a wonderful God how he gives us things, even in nature and his creation, that serve as perfect illustrations of the way his spirit and his word and his will works in our everyday lives. We can look at the things around us. His winnowing fork is in the hand to clear his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn. But the chaff he will burn up with the inextinguishable fire. Huh, Brother Ray, do you think it's inextinguishable? Our firemen back there. <laughs> yes, so, since it is. God said it, that settles it. Amen. Through John. So with many other exhortations, John proclaimed good news to the people. All right. <clears throat> but Herod, the Tetrarch, after being rebuked by John because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and because of all the evil things Herod had done, added even this on top of them all. He shut up John in prison. Now when all the people were immersed, Yeshua also was immersed, and while he was praying, heaven was opened. All right. And the Ruach HaKodesh, the Spirit of the Holy One, the wind of the one true God, came down upon him in bodily form like a dove. And from out of heaven came a voice. You are my son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. The Holy Spirit just spoke to me, and I just got goosebumps all over because not too long ago, I went through an extremely difficult time in my personal life. Really, extremely, more than I ever thought would, I would face. And uh, it's none of your business what it was. <laughs> you can guess, and you might be right, you might be wrong, but I'm not telling because it's none of your business what it was. The only thing that matters is I was talking to my Heavenly Father. And I was talking to the Holy Spirit. And I was talking to Yeshua. But I kept saying, what's going on? How can this be? All those questions. You know, you're serving God and you, you feel like you're a strong man or woman of God. And you're walking in the faith and the admonition of our Lord and Savior for a number of years. And... And, and you've been filled with the Holy Spirit. And then sometimes, I don't know if it's ever happened to you, but it has to me. I found myself right back in the throes of like a baby Christian. All right, yo. And I thought, no, I didn't go here. How did this come upon me? I'm struggling with this. Why? He's faithful, amen. Right he gives us the strength through the Holy Spirit to overcome sin, amen? amen? He gives us the strength and the power to resist the devil because the devil will flee from us if we do, amen? amen. But we still will get temptations. You know, Jesus was tempted, he didn't right. sin. And, and, and I, was, I was thinking, wow, I thought I was through this in preschool. Why is it right on my graduation from college, you know, all right, all kind right. of as, a, as a, an example, am I, am I looking at this again? Well, when I would ask the Lord, he would only answer me one thing. One thing only. All right, no. He would say, you are my son. <clears throat> I said, my God, help. Why am I facing this? My Lord Jesus. And I would encourage myself with the word, you know, because I know the word. I say, what do you have to say, Abba? That's usually what I call 
Lord, I pray that you bring up my daddy. And I would wait. And I would wait. I'd pray in the evening and I would go to bed and I would lay in my bed and I would just wait to hear his voice. And then I would get down on my knees next to my bed and I'd say, talk to me. I'd cry. As Brother Rick Hackney says, I'd squall them all. <laughs> and I'd wait. And usually at about 3 o'clock, Mickey, there that voice of God would come again and he would say, you are my son. And at first I was so frustrated by that, but then after a while, as he was leading me through the time, I took great comfort in that. Hallelujah. I said, I don't know why I'm going through this, but I decide. If I'm his son, I'm a joint heir with Christ. Amen. If I'm his son, he's given me the power to overcome sin in my life. If I am his son, I can resist temptation. And if I'm his son, even if I mess up, God forbid, and you know we all mess up in little ways every day. You don't think you do just uh, I want to go to the grocery store where the lines are long and the clerk is taking forever and three people cut in front of you. Or go, we go on the, when you're late for an appointment and you're on the freeway and uh, people cut you off. Right. See, see how your attitude is. Yeah. <laughs> we make mistakes. But he is faithful and he is just to continue. Yes, he is. Continue carrying us through. Yeshua was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. He was the son, as was supposed, of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Matat, the son of Levi, Levi, Levi the son of, we say Levi, but I believe it's Levi. The son of Malchi, the son of Hanai, the son of Joseph. Joseph. Thank you. The son of Matthias, the son of Amos, the son of Ahab, the son of Esli, the son of Nagai, the son of Maha, the son of Matthias, the son of Simeon, the son of Joseph, the son of Hoda, the son of Huanan, the son of Resa, the son of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the son of Neri, the son of Melchi, the son of Adi, the son of Kosam, the son of El Madam, the son of Ur, the son of Yeshua, of Yeshua. Yeah. Say it again. Yeshua. Give her read these. The son of Yeshua. The son of Eleazar, the son of Joram, the son of Mathat, the son of Levi, the son of Simeon, the son of Judah, the son of Joseph, the son of Jonam, and the son of Eliakim, and the son of Nele, the son of Menah, the son of Matata, the son of Nathan, the son of David, the son of Jesse, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz, the son of Solomon, the son of Nashon. The son of Aminadab, the son of Ram, the son of Hezron, the son of Perez, the son of Judah, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, the son of Terah, the son of Nehor, the son of Zerug, the son of Re Reu, the son of Peleg, the son of Ever, the son of Shelah, the son of Canaan, the son of Arphaxad, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahaliel, the son of Kenan, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, and the son of Adam, the son of God. It seems pointless, but nothing in God's word is pointless. The genealogy is given for a number of reasons because it, it validates that there was a 
historical record that was kept and that they could trace the lineage of Yeshua all the way back to Adam. They could also prove on both sides of his family, on the side of Miriam and the side of Joseph, that he was a descendant from the throne of David. Okay? David. The word of God is so rich and true. But what I was wanting to go back to that's been jumping out at me over and over this week is when John, he's talking primarily to the, the Pharisees and he calls them a brood of vipers and he said, ask the, even the people who warned them to flee from the coming wrath. What was the coming wrath? Answer time. <laughs> Pastor Larry, who was the coming wrath? I'll take a guess, the end times. The end times? Amen. And what was the foreshadowing of the end times? The, the destruction of the temple of Jerusalem? Amen. Of Huck. How about the end to their own religious system? Oh, All right. Yes. All right. Time and time again, while Yeshua was preaching and teaching and going about his uh, daily example of how we should live, time and time again, the righteous in quotations, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the teachers, the preachers of the day, the religious order, the ones that were revered, the ones that were supposed to be the ones in the know, the righteous, the holy, the ones that had the best garments, the ones that, that did everything according to what the Torah said to do on the outside. They were cunning against Yeshua, and more than once they tried to kill him. Remember he disappeared from their midst? Do you remember when uh, they were gathering grain on Shabbat. All right. And Yeshua said to him, he said, you just don't get it. Basically, you're stringing that and sowing a camel. First of all, I'm God. I can do as I please. And don't you remember David when he went into the temple and he ate the showbread? It's not permitted to eat. But David was a foreshadowing of Yeshua as well. All right. <coughs> How? Study it out. That's another lesson. The type of Christ. Yeshua was saying your man-made doctrine are doctrines of devils. Alright, yeah. That's true. Look it up. I didn't give you the scripture, the verse. Look it up. Go look it up. Don't believe everything a preacher tells you. Go Write it down. Oh, I've never heard that before. Talk to the devils. Go home and get out your concordance or get out your Bible dictionary or get, open up the internet and search on Talk to the Devils and see. Did Yeshua say it? John the Baptist, Yeshua said, no greater prophet had ever lived. And he told them, who wants you to flee from the coming wrath. To the end of the religious order of the day. To the uh, uh, end of the, the, the rituals ad nauseum. To an end to the Sunday best, or in, in this case it was Saturday best. <coughs> an end to leaning on the righteousness of their ancestors yeah. as justification 
for what God would favor and honor them. He said, repent. How do you know what you need to repent of? Is it because somebody in the church tells you it's a sin? Um, does the word of God say that his laws are written on our heart? We know when we are doing something that is not pleasing to the Lord, whether we've ever been taught it or not. First of all, if we're born of the Spirit, not walking dead men, if the if the Ruach, if the Holy Spirit, if the, the very Spirit of the living God dwells within us, don't you think we are going to know when we are acting in a way that is contrary to a righteous holy God. Yes, we are. That's why we're born of the Spirit. We're not sleeping either. We shouldn't be. All right. But we also have teachers, and we have the Word of God, and we have the Holy Spirit to rightly divide the Word of God. Yeshua taught primarily from the Torah and the prophets, and what he did is he gave the correct interpretation and life application. He said, I mean, if he was talking today to, to some of the uh, religious community, he might say, uh, you know, I really don't care if you have meat and cheese on the same table. All right now. <laughs> and I'm not trying to offend anybody who keeps the kosher diet according to what the rabbi teaches them. They're doing that out of a heart of love to honor God and what they yeah, believe is yeah. right inside. I, I honor them for that. But in my understanding, as a believer in Yeshua, as the Messiah, I would say that he would say to him, listen, it doesn't matter if you have meat and cheese on the same table. What Abba was saying was, don't boil a calf in its mother's milk because that was a pagan practice for worship of a pagan god. Right. And it was cruelty. It was the, the a deviant spirit. You know, it was very cruel. And we're not supposed to be cruel to God's creatures that he created. And so that cruelty was used to stir up people. There's a spirit behind cruelty. Yes. Right. Yes. And it enters into people. Why do you think serial killers progress and they get worse and yeah. they keep doing it, you know? Because once a human allows that evil to take over their body, unless they're cleansed by the blood of Yeshua and the uh, demon is cast out, that spirit will continue to control them. All right, That's right. That's right. The same thing we have with the young people, not only the young people, but my generation as well, the last few generations I know of with that spirit of suicide. All right now. It, it suddenly comes on people. All right. It's a spirit. And it goes as quickly as it comes when you recognize it and take authority over it. Man. It goes. It goes. Jesus name. Amen. But but what John the Baptist was telling the people was, listen, as much in the same way that I believe many of the pastors today are telling the people, listen, allow the Holy Spirit to teach you what the word of God means and follow his voice. The word of God says that my sheep know my voice All right. and none other will they follow. I hear people all the time say, how do I know if this is really God? Be still. Be still and know that he is in. Be still and listen to the voice. It's not going to appear as an angel of light. It's not going to try to deceive you that way. 
He will never deceive you. You know your Heavenly Father's voice. You know your Savior's voice. Praise God, praise God. And you know the moving and instruction yeah. and power of the Ruach HaKodesh. You know it. Yeah. Lean to that. Lean to that and do what he teaches you to do. There is an example in the Bible where a man had no trade and, they, and uh, needed to be a silversmith. And the Holy Spirit taught him how to be a silversmith in an instant, something that people would study an entire apprenticeship for, for I mean, 10, 12, 15 years before they would be considered a master journeyman or a silversmith, and the Spirit of the Most High God, who is in all things, through all things, and works all things together for good, that Spirit taught him in an instant how to be a silversmith. Don't you think he can teach you which way you should go? Yeah. Don't you think that he can keep you from going being led astray by false doctrines and teachings in different uh, churches that are things that are fads. I can name a few of them. As I was growing up, we had uh, we had the uh, Holy Laughter Movement. Okay, we had the Name It and Claim It Movement. We had the Prosperity Doctrine. We had the uh, oh, Pastor Larry. Think of a few more that really. That's enough. Oh, discipleship. Gone. You know, like. Emergent. See it again? Emergent church. Emergent church. Yeah, purpose driven. Mm -hmm. Church. Things that look good on the surface and then it end up being a deception for the bit of hell. Yeah. All right. Anything that takes you away from the Word of God, the Holy Spirit will not confirm in your life. Right. You can trust it. If you've got to work and you don't get to come to church very often, like your mama. But you know what? When I talk to your mama, she loves the Lord. And she prays that all the time while she's sitting there taking care of her, her patients. And she tells them about the Lord. And she demonstrates his goodness to them. And she tells me all the time different things that the Lord teaches her through the Holy Spirit. I don't even know if she realizes how many times she testifies of the goodness of God in her life. Uh, We're not to forsake the gathering of ourselves together. The word says even as we see the day approaching for the Lord's return, we should come together even more because there's power and strength and unity and prayer and love and encouragement and exhortation. But what we cannot allow in anybody is this uh, condemnation and being torn down and and attacking on each other, backbiting and gossiping. They do that in the world. Hallelujah. I have worked in a real estate industry in Tyler Mestro since I was 20 years old. And every single office I've ever worked in, even the very best ones, have all of that. The office politics. All right. The church politics. The banking order. You have pecking order in the church. The ones that are renowned to know everything. In the church, you have those that give themselves titles. All right, now. They're prophets and apostles. And I mean, it says because they desired the approval of man more than the fear of God. And they were afraid to be put out of the synagogue. Many right. turned away from the truth. Yeah, right. I paraphrase. Yeah, that's about right. Isn't that sad? It's sad. It's sad. You know, one day the Holy Spirit told me it was okay if I wore jeans and preach. I was told for years it was disrespectful. And, I didn't, and oh, a whole long bunch of stuff. All right. Papa, didn't you have an experience where you went to sh church in the wrong color shirt, a blue shirt or something, instead of a white shirt? <laughs> some, some situations and, and, and 
some churches, they have a certain color for you to wear. So I've never been in, in that situation, but I've been to some of them that had just certain colors you wear. So I thank God that uh, I'm in the, in, in the position where oh, I you wear any color shirt. It was Burford. Yeah. It was Burford that had that experience. And yeah. he, had, he was, the Lord had taught him how to play the piano, and they, their regular piano player was not there. They, I maybe mean, it was the organ. Anyway, so he was so excited that he put on the very best shirt. He saved his money and he went to the store and he bought the very best blue shirt he could afford. The best shirt in the whole store because he wanted to honor God. It was the heart. All right, all right. And he walked into church and he was rebuked by the church mothers and by the pastor for, for being so flashy and wearing a blue shirt when you everybody knows if you're truly a Christian, you're going to wear a white shirt really? to play the organ on the platform. Uh, another another uh, pastor in town recently read a sermon from, I think it was the 1930s or 40s, and the sermon was about once you become born again, you get a Christian haircut. <laughs> And it was complete with the testimony of a man in the middle of the service that came from and said, you know what, Pastor? I came to the revival, and I had my hair down to my ears, and I accepted Jesus as my Savior. And yesterday afternoon, on Saturday, I thought I was going to church, so I better get my Christian haircut. <laughs> I went to the barber, and I told him I want a Christian haircut. And you know what? I feel so much holier now. Yeah. You know. All right, all right now. Sister Mary said, I have a mohawk. <laughs> Sister Mary can say anything because she loves me. So. Praise God. Yeah, amen. And she doesn't say it with malice, so it's okay. Might like, scold me sometimes, but you know what we need? Mamas and papas. <laughs> But do you understand what I'm trying to tell you today? I believe what John the Baptist was saying uh, was right in alignment with what Yeshua was going to come and teach. And it, then it was, let the Spirit of God dwell in you. Listen to that voice of God and allow Him to lead you. Not what that person says, or that person, you know. Most of my life I've been taught that Christians don't drink alcohol. And it's a good practice not to. Right. But I know some beautiful men and women of God who have wine at dinner time. And I would be far from righteous to say anything different than their fruits are good. Mm -hmm. yeah. And not, please, no emails. Don't leave the church. Last time I mentioned wine, I had three people leave the church. <laughs> said that I said Jesus was a drunk. No. All right, all right. I had to go to their house. I had to do a public apology. I had to print it in the bulletin. Uh, oh, Pastor, are you here? Remember that? I probably went too far. I tried to, you know, you get so excited. <laughs> Jesus was a drunk. No, God forbid. To be drunk would be a sin. Drunkenness is a sin. But in another place it says, have a little wine for the sour stomach. Let the Holy Spirit teach you. Read the Bible. Decide whether God wants that in your life or not. Err on the side of caution. Live holy. Walk holy. And even if you think it's fine for you to have a glass of wine, I'm using that as a generic because it's really easy to understand. Even if you think it's fine for you to have a glass of wine, you know what? It's not for everybody. No. And it can be a stumbling block. Yeah. 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 And yeah. if somebody sees you in public and you're not behaving the way that they generally expect a pastor or a Christian to behave, 
and they're this close to being drawn by the Holy Spirit to receive the Lord, and they see you acting in a way that doesn't seem to line up with what righteous people do, you can push them away. Right. They can never receive the good news of being born again. So, regardless of our own opinions about things that are right or wrong and what the Holy Spirit says to us. We have to use wisdom, you know. I preached that message where God told me to put my earrings back in and I dyed my hair blue and Sister Plucky almost fell out of her chair. Thank God she had her. <laughs> <laughs> I came so late. A lot of people were mad at me and rightly so. I mean, I just did bad planning. Bad planning on my part. I don't have one ounce of conviction about men wearing earrings. I just don't. There's many men get earrings as women. If, if you're the word of God says I put talking to men, put earrings in your ears. I mean, it's what the society says is customary. Okay? If you're doing it because you want to say that you're living a sinful lifestyle and that's an example of it, then God forbid, that's a shame on you. Right. Mm -hmm. But look, now it's just like putting on a tie to this generation or a shirt or something, you know. But you know what? One of our members sent me a text. So said, will you please not wear those earrings at church because it really causes some people to feel upset, wow. you know. And I said, you know what? At first I had my little snide remark. <laughs> <laughs> but this person loves me and I can receive from this person. And uh, this person puts up a lot for me. Anyway, I said, but because of my great love for you and everyone in the church, I won't wear them. I won't wear them. I praise God. When I'm, when I'm out with the young people, they're like, hey, you're hit. They're going to talk to me. So oh, it, it can be a witnessing tool. Hallelujah, Jesus. But I wouldn't want somebody to come to church that you've been inviting for a long time and they finally come to receive the Lord and because they walk in and the pastor's sitting up there with bling bling in his ears they think, oh my gosh, what kind of a place is this? They get up and they leave without allowing the Holy Spirit right, to draw right, them right. to the altar of Christ. Right. That would not be worth it. Right. A stumbling block. Right. So listen to the Holy Spirit. And remember that God, all love comes from God. Yes. And if we read the first Corinthians, we're going to close with this. Chapter 13. Let's see who gets up faster. Ooh, would it be embarrassing if it's second Corinthians? No, I was right. Now that is my weakness, really. As much as I, I read the Bible, I don't know how many times I've ever, ever. But I don't know one of my weaknesses is knowing chapter or verse where things are found. And uh, usually take some type of a traumatic life experience where I have to cling to a scripture before I remember where it is. Yeah. But um, maybe that's why God allows traumatic situations in our lives so that we run to Him. Just, just a thought. You can read it with me. You can read it out loud with me. Let's, let's, let's read this about God. He loves us. Remember that. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging symbol. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all that I own, and if I hand over my body so I might boast but have not love, I gain nothing. Let's say this part really loud. Love is patient. Love is kind. 
It does not envy. It does not brag. It is not puffed up. It does not behave inappropriately. It does not seek its own way. It is not provoked. It keeps no account of wrong. It does not rejoice over injustice, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, it believes all things, it hopes all things, it endures all things. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will pass away. Where there are tongues, they will cease. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. But now these three remain. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Amen. You know that part where it says uh, love is patient, love is kind. Try that in your relationships. I don't care if it's husband or wife, or if it's brother or sister, or if it's uh, cousins, or friends, neighbors. Try that. Try not to ever throw in somebody's face something you've done for them. Right. Try never to say, but I did this and I did this and I did this and I did this and you're going to treat me that way. Love, if you really love that person, if you are demonstrating true love, mm -hmm. you will do what you do out of love. Right. And you won't expect nothing in return. And anything you get will be just a bonus. But put it into practice. Just that simple thing. Don't keep track of each other's wrongs. All right. How many times do I have to forgive them? Seven times, seven years. That's four hundred. No. no. Don't keep track. Amen? All right, let's stand. Let's pray. Let's close. I hope the Holy Spirit spoke to you today. He spoke to me, so... I leave here better than I can. I hope you do. Thank you for all the musicians and thank you for all the people that participated. And thank you for all the prayer. And Brother Ray, I love hearing you sing. I'm glad you did two songs today. We've got a double portion. Pastor Larry and Robin, I hate when you come and you don't play the piano. So just remember that. That I like you to play something. I have to have, we have to have Pastor Larry come preach for us too. It's like a, you know, if you retain like a tenth of what he serves, you'll be a lot richer. Amen. Yeah.